。那下一场议程呢？欢迎现在，现在他其实已经在台上，大家都看到了。呃、uh, ，Mr. Jordan， 他要为我们带来的题目是 Spyware Ransomware and Worms: How to Prevent the Next SAP Tragedy。请大家给他一个热烈的掌声。Thank you, thank you.、Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this talk: spyware, ransomware, and worms, and how to prevent the next SAP tragedy. So, before we start, let me put this disclaimer that basically、uh, it says that I don't want to override any rights that SAP might have in the products. No one reads it, anyways, but I need to put it. So, as I was just introduced, my name is Jordan Santarcieri. I'm originally from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And my background is very similar to pretty much all of your background. I started as a general penetration tester, red teamer,、um, and eventually I was migrating to this type of systems called ERP, more specifically SAP.、Uh, when I had the time, I speak at different security conferences. I have participated in Black Hat, OWASP, Hacker Halted.、Uh, maybe you're familiarized as well with the Echo Party, is the local security conference in Buenos Aires as well. Through my experience, I have been dealing with SAP systems for more than 13 years now.、Uh, I was able to participate and help to secure and、uh, recreate and testing、uh, projects over a thousand SAP implementations. I work a lot with military institutions, the VS, ONG in the planet, and many, many Fortune 500 companies. What did I bring today for you?、Uh, my talk will be divided in four chapters. Actually, I decided to be a little bit more creative and organize it a slightly different way.、Uh, you will understand why at the end. We'll start with an introduction to SAP because I know that not everyone here might know exactly what SAP is and what is the content of the information that might hold.、Uh, on chapter two, we'll see what is Project RSAP and how it starts. On chapter three, we'll start getting more technical.、Uh, we'll see some traditional approaches to malware distribution. This is actually a real case, something that happened. And on chapter four,、uh, we will put ourselves in the skin of the attacker, and we will see、uh, what might allow an attacker to create a worm that might impact the security on the SAP systems, especially the ones that are exposed to the internet. We will learn、uh, what potentially an attacker can take advantage to exploit cyber vulnerabilities, and also we will learn how to prevent this. Okay? So, without further introduction, we will start with chapter one. If we want to start defining what these type of systems are, maybe the first question that you might have is, okay, well, what is SAP? SAP is actually an acronym. It starts for System Applications and Products in Data Processing. SAP is an ERP. Maybe you have heard the concept of an ERP before. Basically, it's a system which should provide solutions to each different segment. Uh, of a company, for example, it should provide solutions for the HR department. It should provide solutions for the logistics,、uh, etc. SAP will hold all the key、uh, activities that a company may have: credit cards,、uh, pay to providers,、uh, registering new orders, managing the logistics. Everything passes through the SAP. SAP is huge. It's a German company that they have almost 90,000 employees worldwide. They are actually the third biggest independent software vendors in the world. They have more than 378,000 customers. That that number is insane. They are almost in every single country that there is, and I think the last number is the most powerful one. They totally dominate the market. 87% of the Forbes Global 2000, meaning like the 2000 most richest. Companies out there, 87% of those are running SAP systems. For this really, really brief introduction, we are going to divide the SAP solutions in two. Again, this will be a very brief introduction. If you go to the documentation, it's slightly different, but we only have 50 minutes to cover pretty much everything. What I want you to remember is that we will have two different types of solutions. From one side, we will have the enterprise solutions, and from the other one, we will have the supporting solutions. On the enterprise side, all the SAP systems that we will have on the enterprise side, I, I, I want you to remember this little word will be NetWeaver base. We're going to see what that means later on. But enterprise solutions equals NetWeaver. If 
the company only has one SAP system, they will have the first one that you see there, oops, sorry about that, which is the ERP. The ERP is the heart of the SAP infrastructure. If the company is processing credit cards, the credit cards will be there. If the company is doing payment uh, to vendors, the, the, the payments will be there, the bank accounts will be there, everything will be there. Then we have some other solutions uh, that you might hear a lot in the documentation, like BI for typical business intelligence, how companies can send more in a more dynamic way. The CRM, which is going to centralize every single interaction of the customers with the company, very critical information we're talking about here. The enterprise solutions will provide services to the end customers, meaning that every human being inside the company will be working with these enterprise solutions. And from the other side, what we don't care that much about for this presentation, we will have the supporting solutions. Basically, the supporting solutions are oriented towards the more technical administrators, and it won't be everyone logging in there. It will be technical users. So remember that we mentioned this NetWeaver. Well, let's see what it is. NetWeaver, for you to understand, is the framework where SAP is built in. It will be represented on this diagram as the SAP application layer. NetWeaver will regulate how the SAP system will connect to the SAP database, and the NetWeaver layer will also regulate how the SAP system speaks and interacts with the operating system. For NetWeaver, we're going to make the distinction that there are two subdivisions. From one side, we have the ABAP one. The ABAP is a proprietary technology that SAP has. ABAP is mainly used for backend operations, and to put it simple, ABAP is where the money is. If credit cards are being processed, if some payments are passing through, they will be stored in ABAP. And from the other one, we have the Java stack, which was mainly designed for uh, providing like an extranet or for uh, a front end kind of thing. SAP is slowly sunsetting uh, Java for in favor of more modern technologies, but it's not the point of this talk. So these stacks, these different stacks that I'm telling you about will contain different services. Some services will be exclusive for Ava, some services will be exclusive for Java, and some services will be reutilized among both stacks. In the SAP world, let me tell you that most of these services most of them will have its own protocol. Proprietary protocol, of course, closed source. The only way that you have to actually understand how that thing works is like sitting on the chair and start doing reverse engineering because it's not going to be documented. Most of them are closed source. So how people actually connect to the SAP system? Well, you have many ways depending what you're trying to connect to, but I put it here for your information, the most common ones. Uh, the first one is some, through something that is called SAP GUI, the typical client-server infrastructure. That is an extra thick client. You have to download more than one gigabyte for being able to connect to the SAP system. And for what we're going to be specializing today, because we are aiming towards SAP systems that are on the internet, you can connect to the SAP system through a web uh, browser. ABAP will have its own web application server and Java will have its own web application server as well that they are totally different from each other. And both of them, proprietary technology created by SAP, closed source, we don't have real technical documentation to see how the guts of the SAP actually works in terms of the web application servers. So in a few words, why someone will try to attack an SAP system? Basically, it's where the money is. If you are in a company a part of the SCADA system, the SAP system is the most critical and most valuable software that you have in the organization because of the critical of the information that is being stored in the database. How valuable is the information from attacker-wise and from the company as well? So let me tell you about this project RSAP, and this is where the, the talk starts getting a little bit weird. I, a year and a half, almost two years ago, I founded a company called Vixor, right? Where we specialize in doing pen tests, vulnerability assessment, etc. As, as any young company, we have the same challenges that everyone has. Like, okay, how, how we make money? We need customers for making money, okay? Where are our customers? 
Some people, what they do is they just buy a list of companies that they have SAP system. They start doing what is called cold calling, basically annoying you through the telephone, and they try to see if you're interested. Basically, it's the same approach that the spammers do when they want to spam and distribute, for example, malware. The percentage of success of that methodology is 1%, exactly the same as the spammers get. So it's not that much of a coincidence. But we say, okay, wait a second, we, we are hackers. Instead of trying to brute force or way out, this should be a more intelligent way to actually gather information of who is actually using the SAP systems. And through that, the project RSAP was born. Basically, consuming different data sources, and by the way, all this is going to be published by the Q4, we're going to release, I'm not sure yet if it's going to be like a technical paper or directly a Tableau page where you can interact with this. Basically, we consume different data sources, like you name it, Shodan, we did Google Dorks, being my personal favorite, Suma, I'm pretty sure that uh, you have heard about it, through more esoteric resources as well, like uh, private forums on the deep web and so on, the, the kind of uh, places where bad people get together. Uh, so the objective was very simple. Try to map all the SAP systems that are out there and making sure who actually owns that. SAP is extremely expensive. I always made the joke that it's like a Ferrari. There is no such thing as an orphan Ferrari, right? The Ferrari must have an owner. Same with SAP. Someone invested millions out there. Someone must own that technology. So what we did, uh, we created an extractor for each one of the data sources. It was coded in Python and not, not big deal there. And why we need the extractor? Because we knew from the very beginning that that map that we were going to get is a live map. You won't believe it, but SAP systems are constantly coming on and off the internet. Why? Because mainly people also put QA SAP systems and dev SAP systems directly exposed to the internet, which is absolutely horrible. The security of those systems tend to be far lower than the security of the production systems. But it, that is a, a, a subject for another talk. Um, so, okay, perfect. We need a way to understand what was behind the other side. We, we know that it was an SAP system, but what type of SAP system? We were very lucky, as you can see down there, that is the headers of the different web application servers that are exposed to the internet. As you can see, they are very verbose. There are no doubts whatsoever that we're dealing with an SAP system. Look at it. SAP Netware Application Server 721, Application Server Java 731 is an, an SAP system. Perfect. So we have the SAP system. We needed to start uh, adding tags to make things smarter for that. We started dividing this for the different services that we found that they were exposed country and continent from where that SAP system um, was being hosted, which is not necessarily the country of the owner of the SAP system. For example, here in the region, Amazon is hosting a huge, a massive amount of SAP systems in Singapore, for example. That doesn't really mean that the company actually sits in Singapore. And then we wanted to know many other things without actually triggering a hacking payload, because that will be uh, kind of illegal, depending where you are. Um, we wanted to uh, start knowing some silly things, for example, are they providing the services in an encrypted way or not? You will be surprised with the amount of self-signed certificates of SAP services that are exposed to the internet. So once we had that, we started to do who is, we started to try to parse the metadata of the SSL certificates and we did a, a bit more other stuff to actually discover what companies were behind them, who was the owner. Again, we didn't trigger any hack payload. We didn't trigger any exploit. We could have obtained far more information. We could have been more successful in terms of identifying who is actually the owner of these SAP systems. But again, depending on the region, that will be illegal. And we didn't want to start with the left foot. So what did we find? In total, there are more than 14,000 SAP systems, or at least SAP services, exposed directly to the internet. Directly, not through a WAF not through something that is called a web dispatcher, directly. We could hit directly the web application server, ABAP or Java, depending on the case. For those, almost the 40%, without triggering again any exploit, 40% we were able to identify who was it, the exact company or the exact individuals that were hosting that SAP system. 
And we say, okay, wait a minute. Uh, we actually got the version. As you saw, many banners that we got, we actually got the versions. We already did a lot of research in terms of SAP. We have vulnerabilities that are private, and we have also the public vulnerabilities that were reported there. Why don't just contrast the applicability of these vulnerabilities that we have on one side versus the versions of the SAP systems that we got from the internet? So after we did that, we were able to detect that 20%, 27% of those SAP systems uh, that we found were exposed to critical or high vulnerabilities. Basically, you can remotely, from the internet, own the whole box. That simple. Remote command execution, file load, path traversals, you name it. We were very surprised about this. Um, to be honest, when we started doing this, we suspected that the number was going to be a little bit bad. We didn't expect that more than a quarter was able to be hacked remotely from the internet. So we say, oh my god, someone can actually trigger these vulnerabilities, I do a massive warn that pretty much is going to own, could be just for fun or to steal some resources. So how, how we collaborate and how we prevent uh, this spreading. Before we could actually do something about it, we need to start thinking as an attacker. The most obvious way, and again, this was a real case, and I'm going to show you a, a little demo with this, was a distribution of malware through a, a malicious attachment. Not the typical sketchy binary that you send because every single anti antivirus out there is going to block it, but pure SAP scripting. Let's see what it goes. Think about it, we are an attacker. We already know that company XYZ has an SAP system directly exposed to the internet. We know that if the company, if it is big enough, it's not going to have one SAP system. Chances are that they're going to have at least 10 or 20 SAP systems and it's going to be across the board, meaning that it's going to be deeply uh, inside the core of the organization. So if the company has enough resources to SAP, to implement SAP, we can infer a couple things. First, the high count and number of people actually working with SAP. It's very likely that people, a lot of people will have the SAP client out there. And from the second side, that they're using single sign-on, which is very common in the corporate world. So what this person did, and again, this is a real case, is to use something that is called sub-GUI scripts. Basically, if you want to find some sort of anonymous, it's very similar to Visual Basic, Visual Basic Script, but this is entirely for SAP. Visual Basic, uh, sorry, the sub -GUI scripting is disabled by default on the SAP systems, but through our experience, more than 90% of the companies have it activated. Why? Because it's the only way that you can do automatic testing in SAP, so pretty much everyone has it. So knowing that, this person sends some malicious uh, SAP scripts by email and I was able to force the, the victim that they was already logging in the SAP system to perform X amount of steps inside the organization. I'm going to downgrade a little bit this attack because I don't want to literally give you everything away to create a malware for SAP. Uh, so basically what I'm going to show you first, I'm going to just log into the SAP system for you to see how it looks like. By the way, I'm hosting like two live SAP systems here on my machine. And for example, I'm going to show you that we will have a table that that table will recollect uh, the public debt, how much people own to this uh, pseudo company that we have out there. Uh, we have different people with certain amount of debt. Let me show you. What we're going to do, I'm going to show you here. Again, I have the extension of Visual Basic Script because I don't want to give everything away for you to actually create the malware and get in trouble with SAP. But later on, if you have questions of how this could be automatized, and if you have a dedicated guess, I will tell you yes or no. It's, it's quite trivial to make something way better, but just in case to be, to be safe. So look at this. I'm going to just double click on the attachment. Suppose that I'm the victim and I just double click the attachment. Automatically, a lot of batch steps are going to be 
carried away inside the SAP system without the person being able to actually stop the execution. This execution, what is happening in the background, will be on the context of the privileges of the people that is uh, already logged in. That's why it's so important if they have single sign-on or, or not. Um, because if they double click, they're not going to be even prompt with username or password. It would just execute the action. Let me show you here what happened if we go away again with the public debt. On the background, we will see, for example, that the, the amount of the, the, the money that the people own is, is now zero. This is a, just a silly example. In general, the attacker will do something more stealth, but just for the show and for you to understand the concept, I wanted to do something like that. Okay, so what you can do to actually prevent this on, on this scenario that even potentially will be able to bypass the firewalls or whatever the, the customers might have there. Uh, basically, if you are lucky enough to be able to uh, disable this functionality, you can just modify a configuration that is called subgi slash user scripting, you can put it in false. But as I told you before, most companies won't be able to do so. They have to stick with that functionality because it's the only way that they have to do automatic testing. So what you can do uh, instead of that is to change another parameter that is script user scripting per user. Basically what you do there is you are disabling this functionality for all the users except the ones that they have the particular uh, authorization option S underscore SCR and value 16. Basically you don't solve the problem 100% but you raise the bar a lot so only very specific people uh, might be vulnerable. And to the client side, if you're lucky enough, if you're in an environment, uh, a corporate environment that is using Windows, you can push through GPO policies. You can tell the, the client to A, ask for confirmation every time someone tries to execute this kind of thing. So a double click is not enough. The victim will have to do a double click. A pop-up will appear saying, hey, are you sure that you want to use, you want to execute this thing that you have no idea what it does? If the person does uh, click on accept, yeah. But it's more like a natural selection kind of thing. So, chapter four, and we start getting even more technical. As we saw the results, we said, okay, this is really bad. If someone with a minimum knowledge of the SAP exploitation wants to actually compromise the systems, it will make a disaster. So, how we help? Again, we need to put ourselves in the mentality of an attacker. The attacker will try to go for the path of less resistance and try to get the most uh, benefit out of it, right? So what we did is we started studying all the malwares that came in the past. Okay, what are the personality traits that all those malwares actually share? They are designed to hit hard. Lateral movement, especially quick lateral movement, is gold. You want to compromise as many systems as you want. Making noise, avoid making noise was not a priority because you try to hit and hit hard. Then if the person knows what's going on, is there a problem or not? And they're open to weaponize vulnerabilities. What do I mean with that? Basically, the attackers already have a framework. They have the, what I call like the weapon. Then the vulnerability will be the silver bullet that you put there, but the framework, the, the automatization of the exploitation itself is already created way before the vulnerability uh, gets exploitable. So this will be more or less for, for you to have a mental picture in your head. This will be the scenario that we are going to be recreating. We will be the attacker, uh, the left side, hitting an SAP system that is going to be exposed through the DMC. On this case, only a Java system is being exposed on the DMC. That SAP system, the Java one, also has a backend connection to an AVAP system. This is extremely common because remember, AVAP is more for backend, it's where the money is, chances are that the front end systems needs to obtain information from that DevOps system. And finally, that AVAP system that we saw there will be speaking to other SAP systems that are on the internal network. Why? Because it's how SAP is designed. SAP has been born to be highly interconnected. We are going to stop there. We don't want to enter in detail because otherwise we will run out of time. But this is the map that the attacker has to defeat. Okay? 
So the first thing that the attacker will have to do is beat that first Java system that is the only one that is exposed to the internet. This malware, this ransomware, is going to be divided in five phases. First, it's going to penetrate the first Java system through an exploit that I'm going to show you. Of course, I'm not going to give you the whole malware away for obvious reasons, I don't want to end up in jail, but I will show you some code as well for you to see that it's real. Uh, the whole team is real and more than possible. We are going to see each one of the phases and I'm going to show you the code of each one of them. So we're going to hit the first SAP system and we're going to get a remote command execution under the privileges of the user that is running the SAP system. We could go for the database there, abusing a trust relationship without putting a password, or we could do a decryption of what is called SAP Secure Storage. We're going to see what that is very soon. After that, we want to compromise the ABAP system that is also the DMC. So we can do many things. Uh, we can try to use SSH uh, with the, uh, guessing the credentials, or we can do something through another very widely used SAP protocol that is called RFC. We're going to do it, and we're going to see what, what it means. Then we're going to attack the systems that are beyond the DMC to keep this lateral movement through something that is called SOAP RFC and the utilization of a master password, another concept that I'm going to define. And later on, imitating the ransomware thing, we can actually even try to target the clients that are connecting the SAP system. So from the internet, you compromise the DMC, you jump to the server zone, and after that, you also try to uh, mess up with the lives of the poor people that are actually working. Okay, so for each one of them, I'm going to show you the code there. As I told you before, we already have the malware, we needed the silver bullet, we needed the exploit. The exploit that we're going to use is a default misconfiguration in SAP that doesn't affect like the latest SAP system, but according to our investigation, three out of 10 systems that they were exposed to the internet were still affected by this. This exploit, and I'm going to show you, I have no problem with show you the URL that I'm going to be exploiting. Uh, this exploit that you see here basically will allow us to execute operating system commands. Just that simple. I'm going to show you real quick the execution of who am I. Uh, it's going to also tell telling us the, the current pad and some of the users. If my machine... There we go. Later on, if you want to see the, the code, let me know and we can sit together and I can show you. Basically, from the internet, we will be targeting a system on the DMC again and we got remote code execution. Very simple. As you can see on the exploit, we don't need to kill ourselves. It's not, we're not sending nothing esoteric. This is not a buffer overflow. It's literally consuming a URL that was not supposed to be uh, used by third parties. It was supposed to be only for SAP to install itself. We are executing the operating system commands. Okay, perfect. So we already got one foot on the DMC. Why this happened? Again, this is a default misconfiguration. And if you want to actually restrict this or patch this, you will have to implement what is called SAP nodes. That are the first three that you see out there. Basically, SAP node is like an, a patch for SAP. Uh, it's just that simple. Once you apply those correction instructions, then you go to something that is called the, the Java config tool or the NetWeaver administration page. And basically, you set the enable importer server globally to false. Be careful, especially if you have not so up-to-date SAP system, that first you have to implement the node that is on the warning. Because SAP has a bug in the node that it was supposed to fix the first bug. If you implement the fix without actually fixing the bug on the fix, you will be locking all the users away from the SAP system. Uh, to be fair, the SAP war is very complicated in terms of patching. And unfortunately for the blue teamers, even if you download the whole team and you apply the configuration changes, will only take effect after restarting the SAP system. Just one thing to have into account. Okay, perfect. So we completely have uh, hacked the Java system, right? Now we need something to move, to do lateral movement. Again, we try to keep this on the SAP sphere. 
uh, we could just use a Metasploit exploit, something like that. But no, we want to do it purely SAP. The Java systems have something that is called the SAP Java Secure Storage. Basically, it's a file on the file system that is encrypted with triple DS that will store something that is called the master password. We are going to be talking more about the master password later on, but for you to know, basically, it will hold the password for the SAP administrator and the password for the SAP database. All that will be stored in that single file. That file, as I said before, it is encrypted with triple S. And in order for you to be able to actually decrypt that, you will need a key. One second. My machine is about to melt. Almost there. Okay, for the key. Demo gods are not being kind today. There we go. You will need that key. Basically, it's a hard-coded key. How you get it? Basically, you start reverse engineering how the binaries work. On this case, it was even easier because it was hard-coded in a jar. So you get the jar, decompile the jar, start looking around, and you get the hard-coded key uh, that is over there. Once you get that, it's quite trivial to get the secure storage through the remote code execution that we got later on and basically decrypt the secure storage, allowing us to get the SAP password and the whole JDBC connection to the SAP database. You have two very powerful passwords right there. You will see that they are very different, and uh, sorry, very similar, and in most cases they will match. We're going to see later on that that is something that is called the master password, but we're going to see it very soon. So this secure storage actually is two files. From one side, you will have the dot properties will, will contain the, the, the encrypted file itself, and you will have another key, a key phrase that you will use in combination with this uh, hard-coded key that we got. Basically, if you're able to open the secure storage, that's pretty much game over. You get the master password. So again, from this scenario, we completely compromise the Java system, and now, as we support, we, we want to keep moving to the backend, the this SAP ABAP that is on the backend, and the internal network. So how we're going to do this? There are many ways that you can try to reutilize those credentials. Uh, first of all, you can just do a simple brute force. You can try to see through SSH if the SAP system is using the same credentials there. Or, if you want to do it the smart way, there is something that is called the JCO destinations. You, do you see the arrow from the Java side going to the ABAP? Well, that is through something that is called a JCO destination. Basically, at some point of the database, SAP has a connection that says from IPX to IPY, connect with these hard-coded credentials. And the hard-coded credentials are also encrypted. How they are encrypted? Well, you guess it right. It's with the same triple DS and with the same hard-coded key that we found before. So automatically, a part of getting the master password for the Java system, we also have credentials for the ABAP backend system. This is by just compromising one SAP system and abusing the functionality that is already built in in SAP. SAP tends to reutilize things a lot, by the way. So, what we can do here, apart of getting the JCO destinations, yeah, we, we were able to compromise the second system, but we want to keep moving forward. We want to jump to the systems that are on the internal network. This is a malware. We want to either do a ransomware or we want to expand uh, the amount of systems that we compromise. Oops, sorry. How we do it? With this concept of master password. 
This is a concept that SAP has created. At the installation time, when you are actually installing your SAP system and you need to put a, a, a password for the SAP system, SAP will tell you, hey, do you want to use a master password? Meaning that the SAP operating system user, the SAP database user, the, the highly privileged administrator users that will be at the application layer will all share the same password or you want to assign one different password for each one of the users. Unfortunately, this master password comes enabled by default. So guess how all the main organizations out there have the configuration. Yes, most companies use this master password. From the attacker point of view, that is awesome because you compromise one layer no matter through what exploit, through Metasploit or through the common execution, no matter what, you compromise one layer and you have a very, very good chances to be able to reutilize that password pretty much everywhere. This happens a lot. So what we're going to do is to reutilize that and I'm going to show you how we're going to do it. Uh, we're going to invoke another SAP functionality that is called SOAP RPC. Basically, it will be a proprietary SAP web application system, uh, sorry, web application that we're going to trigger, we're going to send an XML, and we're going to get a response. We're going to be reutilizing this master password. And of course, we're going to be bypassing directly the firewall because this uh, attack that we're going to do is not going to come directly from the attacker, it's going to come from the backend system that we already have access to. So the firewall that you see, the second firewall that is between the backend on the DMC and the internal network, of course, is going to let the traffic go from that point to the rest. So, and I'm going to show you, of course, the, the, the whole thing. I told you that we're going to attack the systems on the DMC and we're going to do this sober FC thing. We're going to see very soon how, how it goes, but we want to go beyond that. We want to be able to compromise or, or at least try to infect even the people that uh, are being inside the SAP system, right? So I was doing uh, research and trying to see, okay, how someone can actually uh, trigger a message or redirect to the user or push software to the users that I connected through the sub GUI. And going to the documentation, of course, only one third of the functionality that is there is properly documented. Uh, going through the documentation, I saw that you can force a pop up on every single user that is connected to a server. This main functionality was uh, originally created in terms, if you had to do like an emergency maintenance. So you can send a message to everyone that is connecting to you to say, hey, you know what? Be careful because the SAP system is going to be shut down in, I don't know, five minutes. We're going to reutilize that functionality to send whatever message we want to the user and make them believe that that person will need a new update. So a URL will be there that the person will have to click on. So let me show you a little bit of the code for that. This, again, if you want to see it um, with me when we finish, I'm more than fine with it. So we're going to be targeting something that I told you before, is the SOAP RFC. Basically, the Sober FEC is an application that also comes by default that is going to be host on these web application servers that the SAP has, again, by default. You find a lot of this Sober FEC out there. In general, it's almost like a 50-50 in terms of if it's activated or not. So basically, we are consuming this URL, slash SAP, slash BC, slash SOAP, slash RFC. And we're going to send a payload. Basically, it will be just an XML. Here, just for the demo sake, I'm just using one user. I'm just trying to send information to one user. You could put an asterisk and send it to pretty much everyone that is connected there. 
basically this is going to allow us to create a pop-up that's going to say hey you know what your SAP GUI is running with a deprecated version and it could cause an irreparable damage please update now and we are going to put a URL for the user to actually go there and trigger the execution this the execution of this a particular uh, application is authenticated but remember that we already got all a lot of passwords from over in the security storage and we are guessing that that password is also the master password so what we have to do here and let me go to the beginning for you to see basically what we're going to do here is to execute this and you will see a pop-up this same pop-up will appear to pretty much every single customer that is connected to the SAP system. Every single one will receive that same thing. I'm going to, at the end, I'm going to combine pretty much everything so you see the whole workflow of the malware, not step by step. But I'm going to do it soon. Okay, so before I show you the code, we can uh, wrap up. So how you make things better? Well, the first thing that you need to ask yourself, especially if you are on charge to protect this kind of systems, is do you actually need to expose the SAP system directly to the internet? Uh, you might be thinking, yeah, but it's not a big deal. I just put a WAF out there and let the WAF do its job. Well, to be fair, and you will find it, don't believe me, you will find it by yourself, all those WAF that are out there, the signatures that they have, which is how they protect this kind of systems, they're almost none for SAP. They're not, uh, they are not SAP aware. So you have a high, high uh, probability of even if you have a WAF out there and it's super patched, etc., these attacks will still be undetected. If you want to put something to actually make things better, uh, you have to implement something that is called the SAP Web Dispatcher. Basically, it's a binary that SAP will give us for free, where you are going to implement an ACL file over which application uh, you want to connect to and how that application is going to be consumed. Patching is very important. It's something extremely difficult in SAP because it's huge. You have like a major version, a, a, a small version, you have a kernel version, you also have components inside SAP and each one of those components has its own version. It's actually, to be fair, it's quite difficult to patch. And in general, uh, the organizations that they do it better, they take at least six months to patch. Uh, most of them, they patch every year. It, it is how it is. Audit trails. Most of the audit trails in SAP, like the logging, they do not come enabled by default. Meaning that if you have a problem like the, the ones that I was describing before, if you don't go there and activate them one by one, you will have absolutely no data to do a forensic investigation over this. I did a lot of forensic investigations and it's very painful when the customers doesn't have the whole team. Another thing that is very beneficial for everyone is to make sure that your SOC is SAP aware. In general, I like to make the joke that it's kind of like a Venn diagram that doesn't intercede because from one side you have the IT security guys that are very skillful in IT security, but they might not know what SAP is and how they, they work with SAP. And from the other side, you have the SAP guys, which they know a lot of SAP, but not necessarily they know about IT security. So you need to try to train your SOC so it at least has the basic tools to react in case of an incident. At least it's they're able to parse the logs to try to figure out what is going on. And finally, prevention there. Uh, try to follow, SAP has released some best practices. Basically, it's the long hanging fruit, but it's at least something that you can do for free. You don't need someone else. You just download the guide and try to implement the security configurations. You can do all this, you can do whatever you want. So before finishing this, I'm going to the questions. As I have more time, I'm going to show you every single thing that you saw in faces. I just created myself in one single malware. This is like connect to the Java system on the Java, they get the security storage, decrypt the security storage, reutilize those passwords to propagate and send the pop-up.
basically it concatenates everything that you saw there. It will be pretty transparent, you, you won't be able to see much because it's going to be very fast, but here it goes. This is the, the push of the attack, uh, connection through SSH, and even the remote command execution at the beginning to actually decompile the security storage. Okay, and I think we are doing perfect with time. We have five more minutes, which is ideal in case you have follow-up questions. Uh, don't be shy, and if you happen to uh, I don't know, remember a question later on, that's my Twitter. My DMs are open. I'm always pretty happy to speak about these things, so don't be shy. Thank you for your time. Okay, um, you mentioned one thing at the uh, takeaway uh, slide, um, something what you call the, um, the SOC need to be ASP aware. Are you referring to some kind of SIM solution that can pass the log from the uh, SAP solution? Or you are referring to some kind of solution or some kind of um, uh, application so that we can correlate the uh, rules uh, or the logs of any kind of attack on SAP related? Well, very good question. Well, basically, I was referring first to the education itself, like to try to to train the SOC to understand how SAP works, at least like the fundamentals and like how, what the logs are, especially in SAP. Many of the services that you saw there have a different log, and the logs have nothing to do with each other. They're not normalized, they're very different. Yes, uh, going back to your question, I was mainly saying training, but you do have solutions. You have one solution from SAP, there are private vendors out there, and even I know people that are trying to do something more like homemade, like getting the logs and using it with Splunk. It depends a lot on your organization on how busy or how much workload your SAP system is going to take, because it will be directly proportional to the amount of information that you have to correlate and deal with. You're welcome. Okay, how Any more questions? Jordan